And I hope you like this dis uh, this uh, Dhamma talk this evening, because I just uh, hope you're not disappointed by it. I don't think you can be disappointed by this evening's Dhamma talk, because this evening's talk is on the subject of disappointment. <laughs> It's something which keeps on coming up in people's lives, which makes you upset, because how many times have you been disappointed? I'm sure if you ask you know, some of my uh, family, you know, they're really disappointed in me becoming a monk. I could have done so much other things. Certainly some of my old girlfriends were disappointed. What? Become a monk? You should have married me. And I'm sure the government is disappointed in me, especially the treasurer, because I've made no contribution at all to the economic welfare of Australia in the 26 years I've been here. I haven't done anything, I haven't paid any tax. And I say that quite sort of on air, so it doesn't really matter because I haven't earned anything. So I must have been a great disappointment to the economists of Australia. But of some, some people here, or hopefully you think, I wasn't a disappointment at all. But why is it that sometimes people look at life and they feel disappointed? Why is it that things happen in your life and you feel, oh, why did that happen and why did it happen to me? It's not fair. And looking at disappointment and just how it takes away the happiness and the joy and the energy of your life. It's one of those forms of suffering which as a Buddhist we can look at, understand and through the understanding of it we can transcend and be a person who's never again disappointed in life. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? To be someone who's never disappointed at all ever again. So. What is the cause of this terrible thing called disappointment? And of course, you want number one, expectations. We expect so much of each other. We expect so much of life. We expect so much of ourselves. And that's the first reason why we get disappointed. Now come on, you've all been alive long enough to know the rules of the game. You know, your football team can't always win. The person you want to win the election can't always win. You know, you can't get what you want in life. And so there is actually one way of actually getting what you want in life, is not to want anything, then you always get what you want. Figure that one out and then you know how to be happy. But, <laughs> we always <laughs> tend to have expectations which are totally beyond what life can give us. And so no wonder that we get disappointed. And of course you know all those expectations. That's what advertising does for you. When you buy that new car, then you'll be happy ever after. When you buy the bigger house, you just pay off the mortgage, then you'll be happy. When you find your soulmate in life, even last week someone said, you know, they're looking for their soulmate. Look, we Buddhists don't believe in a soul, so how can you have a soulmate? Come on. Because <laughs> we always think there's a person made for me up in heaven. There's someone who was meant for me. And I, like, come on, you've been watching too many movies, reading too many Mills and Boone books. It doesn't work. Just ask someone who has been married. And they will, <laughs> and they will tell you. Now, I remember this one story of disappointment which I read the other day about the person who was, you know, they found him just in Karakata. And he was weeping over a grave. And he was just so disappointed. Why did you die? Why did you die? Why did you die? And someone came up to him and said, what's wrong? You know, they saw it was a male grave. Is that your son or your father? He said, no, I'm just so disappointed he died. Well, who was he? And he said he was the husband of my present wife, the former husband that was. <laughs> Why did you have to die? Why do you have to die? <laughs> I got that from a joke book. <laughs> Amazing just how many Buddhist things you get from joke books. <laughs> but the reason is sometimes when you, look, when you go into a relationship, into a marriage, you have all these expectations, you know, which are just totally beyond reality. Mostly because of you know, movies, books and just wishful thinking. 
And our problem is, is once we are not grounded in reality, you know what the Dhamma means, actually reality, truth, the way things really are. And once we're not grounded in that reality, we're just opening ourselves up for disappointment. So one of the greatest ways of overcoming disappointment is actually understanding life and understanding how much it can give and not ever expecting more than life can give you. In other words, you know, reading the contract, you know, knowing what a thing can do. And I mention relationships very often because so much suffering comes around relationships. If you've got a partner in life, don't expect too much of them. Even better, don't expect anything at all. <laughs> there was another story I read in the same book where that previous story came. This husband and wife, they've been together for a long time. And he was saying, look, there's nothing I wouldn't do for my wife. And there's nothing my wife wouldn't do for me. That's how we live, doing nothing for each other. <laughs> you see, I'm a monk, you know, that's why I got negative, not really negative about marriage, but what are you really saying? That's just a little joke. But when we expect so much of our people we live with, and also when we expect too much of ourselves, that's just opening up for disappointment. So, when you lower your expectations, it's not the fact that you don't reach so high in life. It's not that you, that you don't um, work with that person to try and improve them. What you're actually doing is you're working with a relationship, you're working with life as it is, by understanding it, understanding how much you can do, so you're never going to be disappointed in life. I remember just in my uh, years as a monk, that I once managed to see one of the great monks in, in you know, our tradition, he wasn't sort of, not talking about a Thai monk, this was a German monk, Venerable Jnana Ponika. I only saw him like for one day in Sri Lanka many, many, many years ago. He's you know, translated many books. There's a few sayings of that monk, which I don't think he's wrote down in any book. But one thing I always remember to him, he said, look, at the end of the day, and I don't mean the end of the day like politicians say, I mean the end of a real day, you know, like 24 hours just before you go to bed. Now he said, well, at the end of such a day, if you go to bed at night and think you've done the very best you could possibly do, then you should go to bed happy and peaceful. It doesn't matter what you've achieved or what you've failed or how many disappointments or successes you've had in life. If you've done your very best, you look back and see that's as much as I could have done, then there's no reason for any disappointment at all. And actually, it wasn't Venerable Jnana Taloka, it was actually another monk, Venerable uh, Jnana Wimmela, so another German monk, he's a very great monk who I, who I once met. And I must say that he gave the best Dhamma talk I've ever heard in my life, just by chance going to visit him in a, a small temple in Colombo some years ago. He's dead now. But anyhow, and just that little saying always remained with me. Sort of at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you've succeeded or not, if you've done the very best, then you don't need to feel disappointed. What that is actually doing is understanding the nature of life. The nature of life doesn't mean that you can succeed in your goals. In fact, the goals which you set, you know, trying to achieve things, trying to get things, trying to have a good relationship, it doesn't matter if you succeed in your relationship as long as you succeed in trying. It's in the trying where you find success. And it's in the trying that you will never be disappointed as long as you've given it your very best. And what does it mean by giving it your very best? I mentioned this uh, some weeks ago in the, just the context of people in caring professions, and I know there's many people here who are doctors, nurses, psychologists, or just help other people as their profession. And I mentioned especially for doctors, and also for nurses, but especially for doctors, your job is not to cure anybody. Because if you try and cure a person, you're going to get disappointed sometimes. Basically, they're going to die on you, or the sickness is not going to get better and eventually you get so disappointed that you couldn't do anything. But if that is your goal to cure, you are going to get disappointed and the reason is you're expecting something which life can't give you. People are going to get more sick, they are going to die, that's reality. But you're also missing the point of life. And it's understanding Dhamma, the truth, you understand what the point of life. The point of life is not to cure, it is to care for people. 
And if doctors, nurses, psychologists, or psychiatrists, or anybody, if you made that your main priority to care, then you never get disappointed in life. Because that's something you can always do, to care. But you can't always cure. In the same way, in a relationship, husband and wife, you can care for the relationship, you can put your best into it, do the, as much as you possibly can, but sometimes those relationships aren't going to work, they are going to split up, it's just you know, not meant to be, or come, or whatever you call it. But as long as you put your very best into that relationship, you've cared for it, then you won't be disappointed. You've done your very best, so at the end of the day, you think, well I tried my best, it just didn't work out. Great, wonderful, well done. You should feel at peace and happy with yourself. And so you can see the, pri the goals is not just what people say in the world, having a long relationship, or like you know, getting the degrees, or becoming rich, or becoming enlightened, whatever that is in your mind. The goal of life is actually to care enough to put the energy into this moment, as I keep on saying, the priority is the process, not the destination. So it's how you do things. So as long as a doctor, you're caring, as long as a uh, wife or husband, you're giving your best to the relationship, then if it works, it doesn't work, you're not disappointed because you gave it your best. I know that sometimes people listen to how I talk and say, oh Ajahn Brahm, you're just too relaxed, you let go you know, too much. How can you ever be successful you know, when you don't pursue excellence? And look at our Buddhist society, this is one of the most successful Buddhist societies, I would say, actually, in the whole world. How many people come here to listen to talks, and these talks, not just the people who listen actually here in this hall, but these talks go out on the internet. This, what is it, 20, 30,000 people listen to each talk after one week? This is highly successful. So, but how does that, I mean, you never actually try to do this. This is never your goal, if you're giving a talk, to see how many more people you can reach. The whole purpose of the talk is just to care for this moment, to put as much energy as you possibly can do into this moment, giving a talk, caring for each other. And if you just do that, caring for the process, now that's actually where you're more likely to be successful. And if you give a talk and nobody turns up, or nobody listens, or everybody walks out, and actually people used to do that in my early talks. It's true. I remember that we had I don't mind mentioning her, she's the current president of the Buddhist Fellowship in um, Singapore, Angie. You know, she's a very strong disciple of mine. And she came to stay at a uh, monastery down at Serpentine some years ago, and she was just pottering around in the library, and she managed to get one of these old talks of mine, you know, on the cassette tapes. And I think it was about 20 years ago, 23 years ago. And she thought, this is really interesting, I want to see how much this monk has changed over you know, 23, 24 years. And she played the tape and she came up afterwards, she said, Ajahn Brahm, that was the worst tape I've ever heard. That was terrible talk. <laughs> and I laughed and they said, yeah, of course, you know, that's just when you're learning. But even at that time, you weren't really concerned about, you know, whether people liked it or not, just the effort and the energy you were giving into it. That was what was most important, the care you gave into the process. You know eventually it will work out. And I still remember one of the other monks over in Thailand, he told me this story, that when he was learning how to give Dhamma talks, this, you had to learn in Thai, because these were Thai monasteries. And they, Ajahn Chah told him to get up and give a talk for one hour in Thai. Now that's, that's hard if it's your second language. So he gave a talk in Thai for one hour. And the people in Thailand are much more respectful, even though it's a really a dumb talk, really boring, they would sit there just out of respect, because that's how they've been trained. Not like here, if you don't like the talk after five minutes you're out of here. <laughs> but that's our culture, who cares. But, <laughs> after one hour he finished, and he was about to finish the talk, and Ajahn Chah said, another hour. And he had to do this. And so now this time, some of those lay people, even out of respect, they couldn't sit there. <laughs> so they went for the door. But you know, he managed to get through, repeating himself. And so two hours he talked. And then the quality of the talk was right down the very bottom by the end of the two hours. 
but he, he'd done it. And that judge so said, another hour. <laughs> so he had to go for three hours and he just was having long pauses. And most people had left. A few people who were still there were leaning against the wall just with their heads down, snoring. But he managed to get through it. Another hour, said Ajahn. <laughs> he had to do four hours. And the last hour was the worst possible talk you could ever expect anywhere. Even the mosquitoes were falling asleep. <laughs> and <laughs> but that was actually a teaching of this great monk Ajahn Chah to tell you, look, it's don't have goals of wanting to give a talk and being the best speaker in the whole world and have everybody come up after and say, wow, what a wonderful talk. That's not the point. Because if that is the point, you will be disappointed. The most main point is not just if people like the talk, it's actually what you give in every moment when you're giving a talk. It's caring for this moment. He said, now that is your goal. And if you make your goal that, then of course you're not disappointed because that monk, he realized that he did give everything he had. But after four hours, there's not much left to give, but at least he gave what little he had left. People liked it, didn't like it. That wasn't the point. And later he became a great teacher. That's how you become a great doctor. You may lose many patients at first, but you're caring for people right now. And that's what you can do. And that's what you keep bringing up. By caring for the process, of course you get better and more skilled as you go along. So that's the same in relationship. You know, you care for the moment, you put your energy into trying your best, the chances are that your relationship is going to get better as the year go, years go on. Because actually you're developing it, you're growing it, you don't expect anything, because you don't expect anything, you're putting energy and effort into it. Our problem is, if we expect, yeah, well now we're married, now it's going to be okay. And of course people take each other for granted, they take the relationship for granted, don't put any effort into it, they don't care about it anymore. They think that once you've got the rings on it, it's the same as handcuffs and you can't get away from each other anymore. Now the rings aren't handcuffs, even though they're circular and they've got something to do with handcuffs and you've got one each, but unfortunately there's no sort of chain between the two of those rings. But nevertheless, we think sometimes we don't need to put any effort and energy into it and that's a problem. So. The goal of our practice as married people, single people, doctors, street sweepers, unemployed, monks, whatever, our job is actually to do the very best we can in every moment to care for this moment. And of course then you don't get disappointed. Because when we get disappointed it's not just only expecting but having the, right, the wrong priorities in life. Now do you expect to be wealthy? We actually have lots of possessions. Sometimes some of you come from overseas, you study over here, and sometimes your relations, or you really think your relations, they want you to do well. They want you to go back to you know, your home country later on and say, look at the house I've got, look at the money I've got, and then you're at success. No. Look, I migrated over here from, you know, from Thailand, and look how much I've got. 26 years and nothing. Nothing in my bank account, no property, no kids. My goodness, by all worldly standards, I'm a big failure. 26 of heart years, I haven't even got anything in my superannuation fund. I've got no superannuation at all. My goodness, what a failure. But of course, you know that I'm a very happy monk and you know, I've got really a lot of huge number of good friends. So, you know, sometimes you say I'm a successful monk. But you can see why. And it's not because of possessions, of wealth, of you know, how many kids you've got or how many businesses or shares you've got. That's not the measure of success. And so if you measure success by those things, you're opening yourselves up to disappointment. I know many of you were very disappointed when the stock market fell. <laughs> oh. Many of you get disappointed that when you know, your, your lover leaves. Oh. Many of you get disappointed just you know when you lose that appoint that promotion at work. Now is that the meaning of life? Is that worth being disappointed about? And when you look at it, that's what the world wants you to be disappointed about. That's what the world says is success or failure. 
but you look in the spiritual world and you know this is a truth. That is not the measure of success or failure. As I said, as long as you put your very, very best into that company you started, into those investments which you had, into that monastery you've built, as long as you put your very best into it, that's enough. That is success. And it means you don't need to be disappointed. Good example of just talking about monastery. Those of you who've been to the monastery where I live, in Serpentine, Bodhinyana Monastery, you all know that I was there from the very, very beginning. And you all know that, you know, I've said this in that little book, when I first went to that monastery, the first night I was there, you know, we had I had a door which I slept on. There was three bricks in each corner and a door. We only had two doors in that monastery, so we didn't sleep on the floor because there's lots of an insects and animals that go biting you at night. It was this time of the year, just in January, you know, hot, and I was on the door. We only had two doors. Because I was a second monk, because of hierarchy, the senior monk got the flat door. I got the ones with the ribs on it, you know, it's just these houses had the ribs on the doors. It's true, I'm not making it up, so I had ribs on the door. But I was fortunate that there was one of the doors which the doorknob was actually in the center of the door rather than on the edge. So there was a big hole in the middle of the door. And being a positive thinker, I thought, well, that's actually very good because that means I don't need to get up out of bed to go to the toilet. <laughs> It's a very, very good, so I don't know why they don't make other beds like that with a hole in the center, a bucket underneath, so you don't, you know what it's like getting, you know, these hot days or cold days, getting out of bed to go to the toilet. <laughs> so, you know, I was, that's positive thinking. So, and you realize that you didn't know whether that monastery was going to work. We were totally in debt, had no money at all, and uh, we had to work very hard. And I did work very hard, and it started to work, the monastery. And then it came, so I always remember this because it's an anniversary tomorrow, January the 31st, 1991, when the temperature at Bodhinyana Monastery reached about 47, 48 degrees. And that was before the fire came. It was a huge bushfire that, that day. Crown fire came right through our monastery. And there you were. This monastery which I'd spent how many years, about uh, so many years building up and when you have one of these bushfires, I don't know, this was hotter than the 2J fire which was you know, uh, earlier on. This was a huge fire and when you're actually in these fires, it's amazing to see just the power of nature because these eucalypt trees, when it gets that hot, the eucalypt oil evaporates and it forms this mist around the tree, mixed in with oxygen. It's like a bomb waiting to go off. And this is what happens. Just you know, when an ember comes into that explosive mixture, the whole tree explodes. It was like explosions. This whole big tree would burst. It wouldn't be fire coming from the top or the bottom. It'd be like this, this ball of flame around the whole tree, all in one second, with this huge noise, like a bomb tree after tree after tree, and we had to evacuate. There was no choice. Evacuate for our lives. And when we evacuate, I look back upon that monastery, which I'd worked so hard to build up, and you thought, nothing can survive. None of those buildings, they were right in the middle of these trees. They'd all be burned to ashes. And when I left, I remember just going to the bottom of the hill and from the southwest highway looking up and seeing the whole hillside explode in flames one after the other. The other monk who was with me, you know, he tried to get up and he was arguing with the policeman blocking Kingsbury Drive and saying, that's my monastery up there, I want to get up. He said, you can't, I want to get up, and what can't. And then a few explosions happened and the policeman said, you want to go up? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was true. So you left it there. And I remember that night sleeping in the shearer's shed in a, in a farm close by, just thinking, all that hard work. And those of you there at the time just know, just know how much hard work which I put into that monastery, personally building it, all gone. 
And actually I slept soundly. Because I thought, wonderful. I've given up so much time, what a wonderful thing I'd achieved. And it didn't matter that there was going to be a monastery there the following day. What was most important to me was that I'd put all that energy and effort into it, and so much love and care. That was my success. Not the fact there was a monastery there at the end of the day. The fact that I put so much care and effort and energy into what I did. And I was so happy with that, I slept well. And of course, those of you who know the story the following morning, you got, got up there and it was all remaining. It was a caravan which was burned, but all those huts, those buildings which you see there were totally survived. And even though it was a far more intense bushfire than you saw at 2J. Even I remember just one of the, the head of the bushfire, they, they didn't call it FISA in those days, the head of the bushfire brigade. He had to come for an investigation and I took him around. I remember him seeing one of the huts and I'll never forget the words he said. He looked underneath it and around it, examined it totally and then he turned to me and said, Brahm, this should not be here. <laughs> I remember that, it shouldn't be there, but it was. So it was actually a, a bonus for me. But even if it was destroyed, I wouldn't have minded. Why? Because the destination, what we achieved, was not the buildings, but was how we did it. That was what was most important. So I just wasn't disappointed. And if that monastery had been destroyed, I wouldn't have been disappointed. I think, wow, what a wonderful thing we had done. Great. So my priorities in life from that time and from even now, is not what you achieve, but the process, how you do these things. And if the process is more important than the goals, or rather the process is your goal in life, disappointment doesn't happen in life. How can you be disappointed when you know you've tried your best, you've given it everything you've got, you put a lot of care into it, and you've had a lot of fun on the journey? If you reach a destination, that is just gravy, that is just bonus. But the journey was the most important thing. And that's why you don't get disappointed. So relationships, it's the journey of the relationship, whether it lasts or doesn't last, that's just a bonus. But the fact that you've had a wonderful time together, you've enjoyed each other's company, you've given it everything you've got, it didn't work out, fine. We just had a wonderful time together. And the same and in just not just relationships, just life ends, people die. And I don't know why people just can't accept that and enjoy the process of dying and death and separation. Because you can't stop it. It's part of life. And we expect people to keep on living and living and living and living, and they can't do that. It's obvious it can't happen. But instead of worrying about a person dying, we look upon their living. It's the living is important, not the death. And so understanding that, it's the process which we've had together, the time we've had together, the great wonderful moments we've shared together. And if a person has lived at the end of their life, they think, wow, I've done as much as I possibly could have done as a garbage collector. I've just really sort of cared for all those garbage cans which I've picked up in my truck. And I've tried my very best not to leave anybody or not to sort of spill things on the ground. And then at the end of the day, when you die as your garbage guy and you go to the, the great recycling dump in the sky, and you can think to yourself, wow, what a great career I've had. I've had such a wonderful time as a garbage collector. Whatever else you do in your life, it doesn't matter if you're a garbage collector or a doctor or a prime minister or a monk or whoever. The most important thing in life is just as long as you're giving it everything you've got. And then you never think in life, oh what a great disappointment, I only managed to be a garbage collector and that's what I managed to do in life. Spiritual life teaches you, it's, that's not what we call achievements. That's not what really matters in life. And so it doesn't matter how long we have together. What's important is the quality of that time we spent together. Even if it's just a few days, you know, you've had your child and then he dies after a few days of life. It does not matter just how long, it's the quality of that time you've had with that person. That is what is most important and I think people realise that. Their expectations is not that when you give birth to a child they're going to last forever or for 60, 70, 80 years. We don't even have that expectation. Anybody who knows 
the truth of life means people can die at any time. That's the nature of life. That's why that sometimes people, you know, call me up and they say because they usually call me up, somebody has died. And if there's somebody I know, I actually say I expected that. <laughs> what do you mean they're only twenty? Of course I expect that because they can die at any time. That's the nature of life. That's you expect these things, so you're not disappointed. But especially, and look, I've done many funeral services. Another one on Monday. Like if this keeps on going, we'll have no Buddhists left in Perth. But I think we get more Buddhists. And I usually, you know, after one week, if you go to a funeral, you know, you sort of you count up how many Buddhists have died and how many more Buddhists have you made. So I'm usually in, in the positive side of the ledger. So that's why I don't get the sack from the Buddhist Society of West Australia. But. <laughs> When you look at, <laughs> so I do so many funeral services, and sometimes people do die at a young age. But there's something I've noticed, now this is personally, I've known these people, many of them, you know, come here and got to know them and care for them and talk to them and even visited their houses. But one thing I've always noticed, I'm never sad when a good person dies. And it doesn't matter just how long they've been alive, six, seven years of age, if they're a really good person and they've lived a wonderful life, even only six or seven years, I feel like celebrating their life. But there's been cases where the person's been 70, 80 years of age and they haven't done much for anybody. They just mean selfish, you know, living maybe alone, and you know, stingy. And it's people like that I feel sad, sad about. And I often wondered why it was such a bum, you feel sad at people you know, who've lived a long life, but you don't feel sad at people who lived a short life. And it was all to do with the goodness of their life, just how much they put into their life, how much love and care and generosity and kindness, how much community service, how many times they'd volunteered to join the Buddhist Society of West Australia Committee, because we're taking nominations now. People like that, if they've served on the committee, even for one term, I've never feel sad. They've just used their life wisely. <laughs> That's an advertisement to put in for this, uh, this evening's announcements later on. But if you put a lot into your life, even if it's a short life, it's a beautiful life, so you never feel sad. And that emphasizes the point. You don't even need to feel disappointed when a young child dies, if they've done a very, very good time. And they've really put a lot of energy and effort and care and kindness. They've lived a really good, spiritual, beautiful, loving life. Well done! About 80 years, 90 years of age, and they've wasted their life just amassing wealth and just not sharing it with people who really need it and just not caring or spending time with other people and neglecting the spiritual side of their lives. So just what a waste of a life that is. And you feel just, they don't know the process. It reminds me of a story, and this is a story, I used to sometimes tell this on retreat, I haven't told this for a long time now, and it's about the, the old seaman, the old sailor, and the professor. Now in these Buddhist stories, the person with a simple job usually comes out superior, especially when professors are mentioned, which is one of the reasons professors always get a bad rap in Buddhism. That's why we don't get many professors coming here. But, there was a professor and an old sailor. Now these were the days when people would go from country to country in boats, you know, before we had cheap aircraft to you know, take you to place to place. So this man, he was going from uh, Sydney to uh, San Francisco uh, to give some lectures, this professor. And the first night on the boat from mm -hmm. Sydney, you know, he had his dinner, you know, in the, um, uh, what they ever call it, the galley or whatever. And after a beautiful dinner, he went out on deck just to take the air, the first night out on sea, as people do. And as he was walking out on deck, he saw this elderly sailor, this old man, just leaning over the, um, the railing, looking at the sea underneath. And he decided to have a conversation with this old sailor because even though this was a simple job, this man must have been sailing the oceans for such a long time, surely he must have learned something useful. And the professor was always wanting to increase the store of his knowledge, thinking that that was the meaning of life. 
So I went up to the sailor and said to him, and said, old man, how long have you been a sailor? He said, ever since I was a young boy, about 13 or 14. It's many, many years I've been sailing these oceans. He said, oh, that's amazing. He said, you know, on that sea which we're sailing on, there's so much life in there. You know, as an old sailor, you must be an expert on marine science, about all the animals which depend upon the ocean underneath us, and all the currents and the reefs underneath. You know, let's have a conversation about marine science. And the old sailor said, about what? About marine science. What are you talking about, said the old sailor. I don't know anything about marine science or the animals under the sea. What, said the professor? all those years at sea and you never bothered to pick up a book and learn about the oceans underneath you? No, said the sailor. You stupid old man, said the professor. You've wasted your life, stupid old man. And he walked away in disgust at this old man who'd wasted his life actually on the oceans never learning about them. Next night at sea, he had a very, very beautiful meal, and he was in a good mood. So when the professor walked on deck the second time, there was the old sailor on watch, and this time he was just looking at the stars. And that was actually one of the hobbies of the professor, astronomy. He said, ah, fair enough, the poor old man, he may not know about marine science, but he must know about astronomy, because in those days before GPS, that's actually how you could navigate by the stars. So he went up to the old man and said, look, I'm sorry what I said to you last night. You know, I'm, you know, you may not know about marine science, but I bet you know about astronomy. And that's my hobby. Look at that beautiful Ursa Major out there. He said, Ursa what? You know, the stars above you. You know, you must know a lot about astronomy. That's guided your ship. He said, I know nothing about that. The captain knows about it, not me. What, said the professor? all those years at sea looking up at the, the heavens above you and you've never ever bothered to learn about astronomy, you stupid old man, what a waste of a life. You've wasted your life, you stupid old man. And the professor walked away in total disgust. Now the third night at sea, it always has three in Buddhism. <laughs> Actually it has one more, but I'll come on to that later. The third night at sea, now the cook, you know, it made it an am amazing dinner. It was just so delicious. Straight away it put the professor in a good mood. And when he went up to, to deck, it was one of these balmy nights over the ocean. Just a gentle, almost fragrant breeze was, was wafting you know, over the ocean. And it was such a beautiful evening. The professor said, oh, come on, I'll, I'll give this old sailor another chance because the professor was a professor of meteorology. And he realized sailors may not know about marine science, or just ordinary sailors may not know about the stars, but they must know about the weather. Because it's the weather, the power of the winds, which drives these ships. And if there's a storm, that could sink the ship. So the weather is one of the most important things for the sailor to understand. So he went up to that sailor and asked him, he said, look, I'm so sorry. I was in a bad mood the last two nights and I, I misjudged you. Sure, you may not know about marine science underneath you or astronomy above you, but I'm sure you must know about meteorology, about the winds, the weather which drive the ship, which could ruin the ship or give it safe safety. Let's talk about meteorology. Meteor what? <laughs> said the old sailor. You know, about the winds and the storms. I know nothing about that, said the sailor. I'm just a simple sailor man, that's all. What? What? You stupid old man. You dummy, you nincompoop. All those years, what a waste of a life. You just wasted your whole life, you stupid old man, said the professor, and walked away. And he decided he'd never ever talk to that fool again. Fourth night at sea, he never went to the galley for dinner because it was one of those nights at sea which were rough. And he suffered from uh, seasickness. You know, putting anything in your stomach would just come out again afterwards. So he stayed in his cabin. And as the night grew later and later, 
the storm got worse and worse. And in the ship, you can actually feel it because the boat starts to rock and rock and rock. And you can feel the waves bashing against the hull of the ship on the other side of your cabin window. And it was a very rough night. And the storm got worse and worse. And it reached its peak about midnight when he heard this big crash on his... Shut up, dogs. You don't need to get excited. He had this big crash. <laughs> and he was scared. And after the crash, there was a few moments of silence. And then he heard people rushing and running around outside his cabin door. And in panic, he opened the door. And who was running right outside? The old sailor. And the old sailor paused for a moment. And he looked at that, captain, that uh, professor and said, Professor, in all your years, have you ever learnt about swimming? <laughs> uh, actually, no, said the professor. What a waste of a life, the ship's sinking. <laughs> And the moral of that story is, you stupid old professor, it's okay to learn about astronomy or sort of marine science or even meteorology if you're a sailor, but the most important thing to know as a sailor is how to swim. <laughs> and the moral of that story, the most important thing to know about life is not about electronics, driving a car, it's actually how to swim to keep your head above water in the uncertainties of life. Yeah, there are calm days in your life. There were storms in your life. But have you learned how to swim in case your ship sinks? You lose all your money, your partner leaves you, someone dies, the stock market crashes. If you can't swim, then disappointment will sink you. So what do we mean about swimming? It's very simple, knowing how to care to have compassionate, to know what's really important in life. And then you never drown. Yeah, somebody dies. But you have this wonderful compassion to let them go. You have this wonderful care for life. Not trying to get angry about life for taking someone you love away. To have this wonderful compassion for the past. You've had a wonderful time together. Oh, thank you so much. Compassion is what opens the door of your heart to the world, to reality, to life and death. And if you open the door of your heart to life and you care for it, then you will always float. You know how to swim. And of course, disappointment never happens. Just like the doctor, you've cared and cared and cared as best you can and the person has died. Beautiful. We've had this wonderful time together. I've cared for you and you've cared for me. We couldn't have done any better. You have swum. You have not sunk. Disappointment will never ever ruin your life. And that way we understand about what the most important thing in life is. The most important thing in life is learn the art of swimming, to keep your head above water, not to sink in the difficulties in life, because difficulties do come. Yes, yeah, sometimes the, you know, things go wrong in life. Things don't happen. People let you down. People you trust and thought you were your friends start to attack you. Things, you don't get expelled from a monastery which you loved. Disappointment, no. I've done my very best. We tried our best, but it just didn't work out. We had a wonderful time when we were there together. Thank you so much. Then you will never sink in the difficulties in life. And don't think that being a monk you can run away from difficulties. You ask the sisters. You run away from difficulties by becoming a monk or a nun. And those difficulties run to the monastery after you. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I think I'm crazy being an abbot. I, you know, I never wanted to be an abbot. I never wanted to be a boss monk. I had it all worked out when I was a young because you know, there was another monk here, you know, Ajahn Jakro before, and I was number two. It was perfect. You know, so you know, 
I always say it's a car in front of the convoy that gets all the bugs on the windscreen. The one going behind is free of the bugs. And so I always had the idea of being number two, tailgating another person. Who wants to be a leader anyway? Anyone who's a leader is just a dummy. <laughs> Anyone who wants to be prime minister, that's why, you know, just if you want to be a prime minister or a president, you know, you must want your head examined. It's much better being number two or number three or four, whatever, because that way you don't have to, you know, be out front taking all the flack and all the making all the hard decisions and stuff. But anyway, it didn't work out that way. Because you no, know, I was number two, tailgating, and then the head monk fell in love and left. And ended up being that's basically that's what happened. So it ended up me <laughs> me having to take over. So you know, I'm a but anyway, what happens as soon as you take over? Okay, not disappointed. Not the plan, because all my plans never work out anyway. I don't know about you, what plans you had, what you thought you were going to do this year, last year. Even actually when you build like monasteries or this temple here or whatever, it's always like the same way a, a forest builds. We're forest monks and one of the reasons we're forest monks, we notice just how forest works, how a monastery grows. It just grows, what are we going to do today? Let's put the brick here, the brick there. Tomorrow we'll see what happens next. Okay, we do have plans. That's the plans actually for the council. But now the real plans, we just adapt. Now add a little bit here. That's a good idea. So we don't actually get stuck and attached to the plans. We want to sort of adapt them you know, as life evolves. So always responsive to every moment in life rather than having this big plan of what you're going to do. So what are you going to do in your life? What's your plans for this year? Throw them away. Don't have any plans except just to be kind and compassionate to this moment and see what happens. And then you're not just dis not ever disappointed. You're actually alive. You're interacting with life rather than trying to sort of control life and fit it into your grand plan of what life's going to be for you. So you know, even building, we don't try and fit. The, the huts or the halls to fit into the plans. We adapt the, you know, as we go along so it fits in to life. And then one of the reasons I think why people like the idea of you know, our monastery is because they do fit into the natural environment because they've grown with the environment rather than being plonked into something like something unnatural. And that's the same with your life. You adapt to life as it happens. Don't have a grand plan of where you want to be next year, where you want to be 10 years from now, 20 years, 100 years from time. Because whatever your plan is, I guarantee it won't work. <laughs> it won't turn out as you, you want it. That's, if anyone asks me what the meaning of life is, the unexpected. That's what the meaning of life is. Unexpected. You don't know where this is going to go to. You cannot predict it at all. So you just have to react to it as it happens and enjoy that process of reacting with kindness, not with disappointment. Big plans mean big disappointments. Kindness means the real success in life. Because with that kindness, with that mindfulness, attentive to every moment, what needs to be done right now, that's all I can do. Keep doing that, learn how to swim, and then whatever happens, you know you always survive. So this is actually how we, how I live my life anyway. And so whatever happens in life, you don't really get disappointed, you don't expect anything anyway. And also if things don't go quite to plan and they're difficult, you don't sort of linger in negativity towards the past. Oh, I should have done this, or why did they do that? They shouldn't have done this, they, life shouldn't have been like that. Never linger on the past, especially the negativity of the past. Things which you cannot change are not worth thinking about. You've got too much other business to be done to actually to waste your precious time worrying about the past when you could be enjoying the present moment. All the people who depend upon you, the time you want to have with other people, don't live with the people of the past because then you're neglecting the people of the present. So live with the people of the present, the person who's with you right now. There's that great little story in opening the door of your heart from Leo Tolstoy, the Emperor's Three Questions, what's, when's the most important time? Now. Who's the most important person? The one right in front of you. The one you're with. And what's the most important thing to do? To care. 
It's a beautiful little story, you know, which I saw as a student when I was at Cambridge from Tolstoy, which is a wonderful summary of this talk this evening, you know, about how not to be disappointed, how to guide your life in the most beautiful, wonderful spiritual way. Don't worry about the past and get disappointed about what happened and why they did that. Maybe your husband or wife has you know, uh, mistreated you, uh, broken your trust or whatever. I just leave that at go. That's in the past. Don't carry that around. That just spoils the opportunity to be with that person right now and to see just another part of them. Don't define anybody by their past then you don't allow them to open up new parts of themselves in the present moment. A person is just infinite in what they are. That's why, because the Buddhist idea of no self means they're not definite, they're not pinned down. So don't ever think that your partner is an adulterer, is untrustworthy, is a liar, is a drunkard or whatever. No, that's, you're only seeing a part of them, a tiny part of them. Let that one go. See in the present moment with kindness, and they will open up parts of the, themselves which you never expected would be there. I've done that in my life with people who have got really bad reputations. I keep on saying in prisons, that's where I saw the worst so-called people. But when you actually just you know, forget about their past and see them in the present moment and be kind to them, it's amazing what they opened out to you, and just what beautiful people they were. And that's people in jail. And no matter what you think about your partner, they're not that criminal, not yet. So you can actually see beautiful things in them. So if you have this present moment is the most important time, and don't be disappointed about anything which happened in the past. Be kind to this moment, that's the only thing you can do. And the person or the event, this moment in front of you, it's life, this moment, that's what's in front of you, not just a person, this is in front of you right now. Care about it, be kind to it, be compassionate about it, be with it. And in that kindness you will find, you will react, you will behave in such a beautiful and positive way. And in that successful process you will find your life will get to another level, the spiritual level, where whatever happens in your life, whether you do become materially wealthy, have a beautiful relationship with other people, or just you're poor like me <laughs> and have no wife, no kids. But still, you'll have heaps and heaps of friends. You'll be the most successful person. Because you realize disappointment is not seeing things as they truly should be seen. Disappointment is stupidity, basically. And when you see things as they truly are, you're caring for every moment, putting your very best, yeah, sometimes people might not appreciate it, but you go back to your room afterwards and say, I really did my very best this evening to give the best possible talk. I've cared for every one of you, every moment. I've tried to put my best into this. I've swum, and therefore I will never drown. And I will never be disappointed, even if you walk out. And of course, no one actually did walk out this evening. A miracle. You see, it does work. That's my talk this evening on Don't Be Disappointed.